And um, you know, it's been it's been a long and fast four years at the same time. And um, you know, we're we're all tired seniors, and we uh, we chose the song um, "Swing Low, Sweet Chariot." And you guys, I'm sure you guys know the lyrics: "Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming forward to carry me home." So um, you know, we all are looking forward to going home to Lamonde Med and Dent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, um, to our true home. Amen. music <clears throat> I'm just trying to figure out why it took you guys four years to figure out you need to form a choir <laughs> that was amazing that was such a blessing um, hopefully we get to hear that again before you actually graduate um, are you blessed this morning Amen. how many of you that uh, went to the Florida trip are still tired yeah you know it's funny after uh, after the Florida trip there are two things that I always find all the time, and that is, uh, number one, people that go to Florida trip always come back like three, four shades darker. And the second thing is, uh, the Holsey Center is empty. No one's working out anymore. 
because Florida has passed. Um, I want to encourage you guys, we still are believers of the health message, amen? We need to work out not only when Florida comes around, but all throughout the year. You do that. All right, yeah, you'll have to excuse me this morning. I am a little sick, um, and so I may cough during the sermon, and so I just want to apologize beforehand. But uh, this morning's message is called, Let God Be God. And let's bow our heads for a word of prayer to invite his presence into this place. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Father, which are in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you, Father, that we can spend this next hour in your word. And Father, I ask that I would hide behind the cross of Calvary that Jesus may be lifted up. This morning, Father, as I talk about, uh, as I talk about you, and as this morning's message topic is uh, let God be God, I ask, Father, that uh, truly we would recognize that you are the sovereign God. You know all things. You are the omnipotent, omniscient God. And help us, Father, to let you be who you are. And so, Father, I pray a special, a special blessing upon the congregation this morning. Pray for your uh, Holy Spirit to be the one to teach us and to convict us. And I pray in a special way, Lord, that as we leave from this place, that we'd all be blessed. For I ask these things in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let God be God. It's interesting how I came across this, uh, this, this thought or this topic. Um, you know, in our church, uh, sometimes there are different teachings that will come in. And recently, uh, there has this, been this movement called the Anti-Trinitarian Movement, right, where they question the Trinity. They question uh, Jesus. They question the Holy Spirit. And this morning's message is not going to be about that. It's not going to be about defending the Trinity. But I realize that as I go on Facebook, I'm a part of this page where, uh, where there are both groups, and they're talking about this particular issue, the Trinity, and there's, uh, you know, there's arguments and counter-arguments. People are posting all sorts of spirit of prophecy quotes, uh, Bible passages, trying to defend their side. And I realize, there, you know, both groups are going back and forth, and, and sometimes it can get a little ugly, right? People are saying things that, you know, aren't, aren't as Christ-like, and, and sometimes it, it causes you to question, you know, like, are we really Christian, right? We're like, going, uh, we're talking about these issues, but we're not having a Christ-like spirit when we're talking about these things. And um, I, I realize that even on both sides, that sometimes there is this temptation to think that we understand God, that we have God figured out, right? Um, I remember this one uh, story that I heard about this um, individual named Augustine, and uh, Augustine was someone who studied the Trinity for 30 years, and uh, he just enjoyed studying the Trinity, and he liked to, to, to enter into conversations with people about this particular topic. And there is one instance in his life where he shares how he was at this beach, and he was walking um, up by the shore. And as he was walking, he noticed that there was, this little, there was this little boy. And this little boy was running back and forth to the water and back to the shore, back to the water, back to the shore. And he noticed this, and he, he, he walks up to this little lad, and he asks him, he says, what is it that you are doing? And he says, I'm trying to get the ocean into this small seashell. And so he was trying to get water and put it into the seashell, thinking that the entire ocean would be able to fit in that shell. But what was interesting is this little boy, or uh, Augustine, basically says, oh, that's, that's foolish. There's no way you can fit the, you know, the ocean into this small shell. And this little boy looks at him and says, it is no more impossible than you trying to understand the mystery of the Holy Spirit with your small intelligence. <laughs> and uh, I think it, 
if I, if I remember correctly, this was just a, an experience, like a, a vision that he had, or not a vision, but an experience where he had, and the boy disappeared. And so there are questions as to who this boy was. Was he an angel or whatnot? But Augustine, after that experience, recognized that God, the Trinity, is something that he will never be able to fully grasp and understand. Why? Because God is infinite. And who are we with finite minds to be able to grasp who God is? Now, we thank the Lord that uh, he is not this complete mystery where we, have nothing, we know nothing about him. Obviously, he has given us the revelation of his word. Amen? And we can learn as much as he wants to reveal to us. We know that God is a loving God. We know God's character. But we cannot fully grasp God in his entirety because we are finite individuals. But, you know, I think that, uh, I think that oftentimes in our experience... It is easy for us to have that mentality, to think to ourselves that we understand who God, we, we understand God. We have him figured out. And when we have this mindset where we have God figured out, it leads us to have certain expectations. Isn't that true? Expectations of God and how he should function. But what about those times where God doesn't meet your expectations? What happens when, when, when you have these expectations of God and how he is to function and he does not live up to those expectations, what do you do with your faith? Do you continue to hold fast in believing in who God is and believe that he is a loving God and just continue to, 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 to be steadfast in what you believe? Is that, is that how, what, what happens when you have that, that experience? You know, there's a story that I believe is, a, is very important for us to look at this morning in order for us to understand what we are talking about here this morning. And let's look at like, the book of Job. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Job, and let's go ahead and look at verse 1. The book of Job, we're going to look at verse 1, and we're going to begin with verse 1. How many of you here this morning have ever experienced um, or have ever been disappointed in God? Have you ever been disappointed? No one's raising their hand? Okay. All right, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's sorry. Yeah, there, you've, you've probably had an experience where you've been disappointed by God because you had certain expectations. You thought he would perform or he works some way, but he did not do that for you. This is why it's important for us to always remember the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which says that we are to walk by faith and not by, not by sight. Job chapter 1. Is the church there? Amen? Job chapter 1. Many of you are familiar with this story, but we're going to go through it, and hopefully we're able to pull a little bit more from this book as we go through it together. The Bible says in Job chapter 1 and verse 1, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And he continues on to say he had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. He possessed, he had possessions, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Now, was, J, uh, was Job a successful individual? Absolutely. He was prosperous. You know, the Bible says that God does not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. And Job was a man who was a righteous man. He walked uprightly. He was obedient to God. And because of his obedience, because of his faithfulness, God was able to entrust him with so much. He blessed him with wealth. He blessed him with, with, uh, with, with, with all sorts of uh, animals, and he blessed him with, with a beautiful family, right? Seven sons and three daughters. Job was a man who was blessed. And in verse, verse 4, it says, And his sons would go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now we're going to get into that a little bit more deeper um, in the middle of the sermon. But we also see here that not only was Job faithful to God with his personal experience with the Lord, but he was also wanting his children to also follow the ways of the Lord as well. Do you guys see that in the passage? And that is why each and every day, regularly, he would offer up prayers for his children so that they would remain faithful in the Lord. Look at verse 6. Something interesting happens. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So there was this big meeting that was happening. We had these, these representatives of, of these different worlds, and here we find Satan is there as well. And it continues on to say, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the what? On the earth. And from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Now question, would you want God to say that about you? Absolutely. That is incredible that God is able to look at his servant Job and he's able to say that this man is upright. He is one who shuns evil. He is a man who is blameless. That is incredible. God favored Job. God loved Job. He knew that Job was a faithful servant of his. And he loved him so much that he wanted to, 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 to bring his name before uh, 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 Satan. And he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Notice what it says in verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job, God, uh, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, his household all around that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have been increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand, touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Very interesting. We're, sort, we're able to see this scene that happens behind the curtain, if you will. We see that there's this meeting and Satan approaches God. And, and, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and he talks about how Job is a, this faithful man who is blameless. But Satan says this. He says, you know, the only reason why Job is faithful to you, you know, the only reason why Job is obedient is because you have blessed him with so many things. He is wealthy. Look at him. There, there, there's no problems in his life. Everything is going smooth. He has everything that he possibly needs. Of course he would serve you. Of course he would be loyal to you. But Satan says, take all those things away, and your servant Job, who you think is faithful, he will curse you. He will curse you. And God's like, all right. If you think that's the case, go ahead and take away his possessions. Take away those things that are valuable to him. And let's truly see if Job is a faithful servant. So Satan does that. He goes in and he causes this ruckus in his life. He takes, his, takes away his, his possessions, destroys his property, even takes away his children. But what's interesting, in verse 22, the Bible, or verse 21, it says, after all this happened, Job says these words. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible continues on to say, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Wow. Wow. Here we find that Job's faith is being tested. We find that he is being tried. But even though his possessions are stripped from him, even though his property is damaged, his kids are taken from him, Job does not curse God. He's faithful. He's faithful. And you know, what? when I read this, I get rebuked by Job's life. Because, you know, sometimes when things happen to me, that are unexpected, when things happen or, 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 or things go bad or sour in life, it's easy to just question God right away, right? It's easy to look up in the sky and say, God, why? Like, why are you doing this to me? Do you care about me? Do you love me? But here, Job, even though everything was taken away from him, he remains faithful and he does not sin. Let's look at the next passage. Let's look at Job chapter 2 and verse 1. Job chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Interesting, Satan comes back. It says in verse 2, The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. 
Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bones and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So again, another, uh, we, we see in this passage another instance where we're able to see behind the curtain. And we find here again, there's this meeting and Satan challenges God again. He says, yes, you know, he was still faithful. We took away, I took away all of his possessions. I took away his children, but he's still faithful. But, but God, if you just give me the chance to afflict pain on him, surely he's going to curse you to your face. Because Job's a selfish man. He just cares about him. He just cares about him being alive and well. He doesn't care about these other things. But if you, if you cause affliction on him, he will curse you to your face. Verse 9, let's skip down. Actually, let's look at verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with, a pain, with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one who is a foolish, as a foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Wow. What an incredible faith. Truly, he is a man who is upright. Truly, a man who is blameless. Truly, a man who loves his God. We find here that he had to be put through this test. All things were stripped from him, and he was inflict, uh, afflicted with these boils. Yet in all of this, Job did not sin. Friends, do you have that type of faith? That when things do not go the way that you hoped it would, when you don't get the grades that you desire to have, when you go into a car accident, or you go into this bad breakup, or the list goes on. When you go through these experiences in your life, are you one to automatically look in the sky and say, God, why did you fail me? Why did you let me down? I thought you loved me. I thought you cared for me. Are you that type of person? Or are you like Job that when things go bad, when the, the storms are increase in your life and, and the waves are, are beating against you, when you're going through that tough time in your life, are you one to say, God, no matter what happens, you are still faithful. No matter what happens in this storm, even if I were to perish, God, you are still faithful. Job had a faith that I believe God wants all of us to see. He had a faith that he desires for each and every one of us to have. But you know what's interesting? As you read through Job chapter 1 and 2, we were able to see something that Job wasn't able to see. We were able to see this meeting take place between God and all, all the rulers of the world, and we also see Satan there as well. We are able to see the dialogue that happened between Satan and God. But you know what's interesting? When you read through the book of Job, question for you, does God ever reveal to Job what happened? Does he allow Job to, to take a peek behind the curtain? Does, is that what happens in the book of Job? No. God doesn't allow Job to see the, the conversations that he had with Satan. He doesn't even explain what took place to give context as to why he's going through all these things. Very interesting. As you read through the book of Job, you find that Job has these conversations with his friends. And uh, you kind of question if they're really his friends, right? Because it's, it's almost like they're, they're having these conversations and trying to instill doubts in, his, in, in Job, in his relationship with God, trying to make Job think that there is something that he did that was wrong that is causing all of these things to happen in his life. And so you read chapter by chapter and you find all of these, these, these conversations that are taking place between Job and his friends. 
And there is times where Job starts to question a little bit. He's like, uh, man, did I really mess up? Is there something that I did? did you know, did, did I displease God in some way? Did, did I say something that offended him? What happened? These questions were in Job's mind. And eventually God shows up. He comes in this, 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 this whirlwind. And he is there to encourage his humble servant. Turn your Bibles with me to the book, uh, to your in the book, Job, and let's go ahead and look at verse 38. Job chapter 38. And if you get there, if you can let me know by saying read. Job chapter 38. If you're not there yet, say have mercy. All right, two people need mercy this morning. Chapter 38, looking at verse, verse 1, excuse me. The Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now I prepare, now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. So interesting. So, you know, Job obviously had all these questions in his mind, but here as, as God approaches him in this whirlwind, as he speaks to this whirlwind, God basically says, prepare yourself as a man, and I will give you questions. <laughs> you know, you have all these questions for me, but let me, let, me, let me just throw some questions at you to ponder upon. And it continues on to say in verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what, to where, or sorry, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the seas with, with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds and garments and thick darkness its swallowing band. When I fix my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it may, might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on a form like a clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and the appraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the door of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may know the path to its home. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail, which, have reserved for, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused, or the east wind scattered over the, all the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing of water, or a path for the thunderbolt, to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it a birth? The waters harden like snow and the surface of the deep is frozen. Now you kind of get the point, right? Basically what God is trying to communicate to Job is this. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You see, Job had these expectations of God. He knew who God was. He had a personal relationship with God. But he could not understand these experiences that he was going through in his life. He could not understand that here he was, he was living a faithful life, and all of a sudden, just out of the blue, he loses his possessions, he loses his kids, and all of a sudden, he's afflicted personally. In his mind, he cannot fully grasp what is going on, and, and the only logical thing must, have, must be that maybe I have done something wrong. Perhaps I've made a mistake. 
maybe I've offended God in, such, in some way, or form, or fashion. But you know, in this, in, this, in this book, I believe that the reason why the reason why God didn't want to, or God didn't show Job everything that transpired in chapter 1 and 2 is number one, he knew that Job would remain faithful no matter what. Amen? And that's a beautiful thing. God was able to recognize that Job was able to handle these things. Because the Bible even says, and I, I've quoted this before, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. What does that mean? It basically means that whenever there's a temptation that the enemy has prepared for you, God will never allow you to, to, to have to go through a temptation that you cannot handle. Amen? He will always allow you to go through experiences that, that, where he knows that you can handle it. And so this basically tells you how faithful of man Job was for God to allow Satan to do all these things in his life. Job must have been a faithful man. So the reason why God didn't find it necessary for him to explain himself, to explain what happened in Job chapter 1 and 2 is because he knew Job and he wanted to give Job the opportunity to trust him even though he might fully understand everything that's going on. And that is, and by the way, that, that is something that God wants from each and every one of us. There will be times in your life where you will go through these experiences and you will have questions just like Job. You will wonder to yourself, why are these things happening to me? It's not like I've done anything bad. It's not like I've, I, I've done anything to deserve this. Why are these things happening to me? And you know, <laughs> the, actually God probably in, in many ways will not, or many times he will not tell you what's, what, he won't he not give you an explanation. You will go through the experience with those questions that he will not show you what's behind the curtain. He will not show you, talk, tell you everything that, that, that happened to lead to this event. But he wants you to trust him, amen? He wants you to, 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 to place your faith on him, to know that no matter what happens, no matter what experiences he allows you to go through, that God never changes, that he loves you, it's still the same, Amen? That he will never leave you nor forsake you. God wanted Job to continue to exercise that faith in him. And I should also say this. The reason why God allowed Job to go through this experience. Because, you know, you read through this and you're like, God, why? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would you allow him to go through such a terrible experience such as what he did, had, had to go through? I already mentioned number one, that is that he, has, he, he knew that Job can handle it, he has faith. But the reason also why God allowed him to go through this experience was to teach us a lesson. Amen? You know, Job's life became ex a spectacle not only to us here this morning, but to countless ages of, of individuals who had questions about God and about their faith. Because of what Job had gone through, so many people have been touched and blessed by his life. Amen? And I'm, I, I, would, I would even go further to say that there are many, there are probably thousands of people who have converted because of this story. Because they were going through a tough time in their life. Perhaps they lost everything just like Job. Perhaps they lost loved ones or maybe all their children just like Job. But they read through this story and they found that it is possible for God to sustain a man or a woman through a tough time. That as long as I just... Fasten my faith on God that he will see me through those difficult experiences. God wanted, or God allowed Job to go through this experience to be a testimony to, to us all. That even though you are faithful, there is going to be a, a, there's going to be a likelihood, actually it is inevitable, that you will still experience trials. And by the way, I want to make a disclaimer that if you accept Jesus Christ into your life, that doesn't mean that life is going to be bliss the whole time. That doesn't mean that when you, you accept Jesus Christ in your life and you get baptized, that, that there's no, not going to be any more trials or any more hardships. If you think that way, I, I just, I'm sorry to shut that down. <laughs> I'm sorry to shut that down. 
but that is the reality. And in fact, when you accept Christ into your life, things will even get more difficult. Why? Because we have an enemy. Isn't that true? We have Satan. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that he is angry, he is wroth at those specifically who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when you are someone who decides to accept Jesus Christ in your life and you enter into his church, guess what? You become the enemy of Satan. And so there's no wonder why there will be challenges, there will be trials, there will be hardships. But what we know from the book of Job is this, that no matter what happens in your life, whether everything is taken away from you or you yourself are afflicted, we can know for sure that God will see us through it. We know for sure that God will remain the same. He will love us just the same. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. I want to share this passage. This is actually my favorite passage that I've held on to since my conversion. I want, to, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And if you are looking for a Bible passage to start with because you want to memorize more scripture, uh, I would like to suggest this one. Romans chapter 8, verse um, 38. Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 38. And if you're there, if you can let me know by saying, Amen. Romans 8.38, the Bible says, this is Paul, For I am what? Are, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other cre uh, created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that beautiful? There is nothing, friends, in this world. There is nothing even that is unseen. No power, no principality. There is nothing that can separate you from God's love. Which means that regardless of what happens in your life, regardless if you even have messed up and you had committed a, a grievous sin, God's love for you remains unchanged because his love is unconditional. I want you to hold fast to that. Because with that passage in mind, with that understanding, it will see you through everything. Because God's love for you will always be. You know, sometimes things happen in our life that are unexpected. And um, even Peter says that, that we should not be surprised when we experience the trial of our faith. We should not be shocked, right? In other words, Peter is basically trying to imply it's expected. Something is going to happen. Your faith will be tried. And you know, I was really, I've been really blessed by the testimonies that have been shared here at our church Vespers, for Vespers Friday night. I've been blessed by David and G's testimony as well as Eric and Christina's testimony. And it's just such a beautiful thing to be able to hear their stories and see how God was able to lead in their life. How God was able to providentially uh, work in their life to, in such a way that, that, that they were able to get to a point where they fully accept Jesus into their life. And let me tell you something that um, if you, you know, sometimes God will have to allow certain things to happen in order for you to wake up. And that was, that's what we see in the testimonies that we hear, that we have heard, and the tes testimonies that we, we hear often. Sometimes God allows certain tragedies, sometimes he allows certain pain to happen in order for us to redirect our focus to him. Now, Eric shared a testimony, and hopefully you're able to hear it sometime, but he shared a testimony of how there was an experience where he had this, this, this nerve issue, right, that caused him tremendous pain. And it's interesting that he had a very similar experience to David, right? David, he had an issue with his back, right? And it was incredible pain, like agonizing pain. Like he was basically saying that if, and I think Eric would say the same thing, that if, if they could, if they get their legs chopped off, they would, right? Because it was so painful. But yet that was the very thing that caused them to recognize their need of God. Their need of God. And sometimes things like that in life will happen. And by the way, God allows certain things to happen not because he just wants to just play in your life, play around with your life, and, and, and just, just do whatever he wants. No, God, God does everything with an intention. Amen? He does everything with a plan. He doesn't do things arbitrarily. 
And so when he allows certain trials to happen in your life, again, remember, he knows what you can handle, but he allows those things to happen in your life so that you can realize your need for God. So you can redirect your focus upon him. Something that really stands out to me when I was listening to um, the testimonies is uh, the love that Eric, Christina, David, and G had for their children. Because they realized that, you know, yes, we love God, but we want to see our children in heaven as well. We want to see them have a personal relationship with God. And I, I really enjoy their story and hearing how they're, they're investing so much time and energy to make sure that they are connected with him. It's very similar to Job, right? Job did the same thing. Job didn't just care about his wealth and prosperity. He cared about his children. And he would regularly make, make the, the effort to go out in the morning to pray for them, to offer sacrifices for the, on their behalf because he wanted to see them with the Lord. And I want to talk to all the parents here in this room. And I want to say this. I want to make a simple appeal to the parents. You know, we often, and uh, we, I'm not a parent. <laughs> but having been in the ministry and have talked to many parents, I, have find, I, I, I usually find this, that parents really want to do everything they possibly can for their children. And that's a blessing. You want to do everything that you possibly can. And so, the, so parents often believe that the greatest gift that they can give to their children is to have a perfect environment where they can grow and they can flourish, where they can excel. And so oftentimes what happens is we invest, or, or parents invest so much time in their children, they want to make sure that they go to the right school, they want to make sure that they, they are able to be a part of these musical programs or sports programs that will make them excel not only in their academics but also in music and in sports. They will do everything they possibly can to make sure that they have everything that they need, all the resources that they'll need for their studies in order that they would maintain that 4.0 GPA and be an honor student. They will do everything they possibly can to provide for their needs so they don't have to worry about anything. They can just focus on what is most important, that is their academics, their studies. And so they buy everything for them, right? Give them the clothes that they want, give them the car that they need, just give them everything. And we think that that is the key. That is what we need to do, that we need to just bless them with all these things and, and put them in the right places, have put them in a perfect environment for them to succeed and to flourish. But you know what I find? I found this many times, and I'm not just talking about here. I'm, I'm talking about in many churches and, and other places I've visited. There are a lot of parents who, though they're sincere, they put so much time and invest so much time in making sure the kids go through all these, these positive places and experiences that they neglect to teach them to trust in God. And they say, they, they actually put academics above God. And they say, yes, you know, God cares about you. He loves you. He wants you to, to excel. This is why I'm pushing you so much to do well in your studies so that way you can prosper in life. And so instead of, the, instead of them teaching them how to spend time in the word of God or how to learn how to trust God, they invest, they invest their time in doing other things. When the most important thing for them is to learn that God loves them and that God is always there for them and that God wants to see them saved. And the parents, they, 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 they neglect to teach the children to trust, to teach children to trust in God when things go wrong. They neglect to trust their, uh, to teach their children to trust in God when he says no or closes the door on something that they want. They neglect to teach them to trust in God even with what, what, with what they say doesn't line up with what they're telling them to do. Or... Did I say that wrong? <laughs> I basically said that. I'm saying this, that they, they neglect to trust them to take God's word even though what they're telling them to do, uh, even though they have something that they want them to do. In other words, to take God's word above their own. <laughs> Took a long time to get to that. Basically what I'm getting at is, friends, parents, we need to make sure that we teach our children while they're young to trust in the Lord. Amen? to make God priority. 
Because let me, I'll tell you this, if we don't, allow, if we don't have the children, if, if, the, if God is not the priority of our children, they will fall away. It's inevitable. They will walk away from the church. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter, um, Proverbs chapter 20, uh, 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not what? Depart from it. And I'm not just talking to the parents, but I'm also talking to the, those who are teaching the children here of this church. You know, to make sure that that is our emphasis, that we teach the children to trust in the Lord, to be faithful to him no matter what happens. Because the fact is that you could put a child in a perfect environment, but that is not what's going to save them. I know this because wasn't Lucifer in a perfect environment? He was in a perfect environment, surrounded by heavenly beings, in the presence of God. Yet he turned away because he didn't trust God. And so you could put your children in an avenous institution. You can put them in a perfect environment in your mind. But if you are not investing time to teach them to trust in the Lord, they will walk away. And I'm going to tell you this, that the most important thing that we can do for our youth, for the young people, is to pray for them. Is to pray for them. Because let me tell you this, uh, my, my mom worked hard, and she didn't really have the time to uh, invest in making sure that, you know, she was going through the Bible's Bible studies with me and, and making sure that, you know, I was always in church and all sorts of things. She, she didn't really have that time to do that for me. But there's one thing that my mom always did for me, and that was that she prayed. And let me tell you, the only reason I'm here in this church this morning preaching you, to you this morning is because my mom prayed for me. And so do not neglect praying for your children. I have so much to cover, but I'm out of time. But I want to close with this last passage, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. It will be health for your flesh and strength to your bones. Very simple. Trust in the Lord, friends. Do not lean on, onto your own understanding. When things don't make sense, when things don't add up, don't question God and say, God, you have failed me. But recognize that God still loves you, amen? And that even though things may not make sense, remember that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. So remember that. And also, I just want to share this as, we, as I pray, before I pray. You know, when it comes to witnessing as well, you know, some, I know that many of us here in this church, we have certain individuals that are, we have in our mind that we think about and we want to see saved or we want them to see the Lord, uh, to, to accept Jesus in their life. I also want to say this, that there's nothing that you can do to change someone's heart. I mean, you could preach to someone to your blue in the face. You can give them Bible studies. You could do all these things, but you cannot change someone's heart. The only being that can change anyone's heart is God. Do you believe that? God is the only one that can change someone's heart. And so I also want to encourage you, you know, I know some of you are, are thinking about individuals and you want to witness to them. Maybe some of your parents are worried about your children. Let God be God. And know that even though you may not see things happening positively in someone's life or you may not see them coming to the Lord, don't give up. Just trust the Lord. Because here's, here's the fact. Here's the fact. God loves those individuals more than you do. And because he loves them more than you do, he's going to do everything that he possibly can to see them saved. And so instead of getting worried, instead of crying or thinking, oh, there's no hope, just remember who God is. Let God be God. Allow, give him room to work. Pray, but give him room to work, and you will see powerful things happen. I guarantee that. Um, I guarantee that God will work and that he will move in that person's life. Now, it's up to them to accept, obviously, 
but that, that doesn't mean that God's not going to do everything he possibly can to save them. So, basically, this sermon is, is simple. Let God be God.